Hey everyone, today on the channel I have Sonal Patel. Sonal Patel is known for primarily the Paint the Medical Picture podcast. We have known each other for quite some time, had a wonderful time just uh, in December over at the NamUs conference, which was a hoot and a half. If you've never been, you have to go. Um, and I love her podcast because Sonal does this like inside scoop, what's going on in the world of medical coding, what you need to pay attention to in the world of auditing, of compliance, of medical billing and reimbursement. She gives you best practice tips to reimbursement activities, uh, accuracy, fraud prevention, and it gives listeners all the things they need to like stay up to date on industry news, stay compliant with revenue cycle manners. So so now I am so excited to have you here on the channel today. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, Victoria, you are so sweet. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely right. You and I have known each other for years, but it was so wonderful to see you face to face just a couple of months ago in December in Georgia. It was phenomenal, mm -hmm. right? To see other industry leaders face to face because you know we've all been kind of holed up in this little pandemic for the past three mm -hmm. years so it was really nice to get out and about and really get to spend quality time with you um and everybody else at the namus conference so yeah i'm thrilled to be on your show because it's huge and i know congratulations are in order for you on your little channel on YouTube, which you know now is not so small anymore. It's massive. So huge and congrats to you because it's incredible. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Um so yeah, it's just I can't wait again to go back next year because it's just I think when we've discussed this in the past, that name is conference, it's like the event of the year. It is. And just like the the best and the brightest, I it think, is. are who go to that conference. So it's yep. you just come back and you're like, wow, you know, just knowing that other people out there are seeing the same sort of things going on that you are in the industry, they have the same sort of struggles, and being able to combine all of your different ideas and thoughts and kind of go, oh, well, how do you handle this? Well, this is how we handle it, and and know also that you're just kind of not alone in some of these struggles is is amazing. Um, but let's backtrack to how you started because I think you've even been featured, if I remember correctly, in some of the magazines like Healthcare Business Monthly and stuff where they talk yeah. about how you had this interesting start into medical coding. Um, you went from working in a museum to into medical coding. So can you tell my viewers about your story and how you made that transition? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's a great question, you know, because people who are trying to, you know, get into the field of medical coding, right, they may be also transitioning from a different career, right, a different entry point. Um, they might have a lot of rich experience to offer from their previous job path, right? So yeah, absolutely. I had my education footing um, in the liberal arts, in the humanities world, right? So my very first career, first job um, after I was done with my education in the humanities was um, in the museum space, right? So completely different than healthcare, absolutely true. But I do think what I bring to the table, have always been able to bring to the table in my career here in medical coding in, in healthcare, um, is the fact that I come in with a lot of communication skills as well and really good writing skills and analytical, critical thinking skills as well, which I brought over handily from the world of humanities. So yeah, but it was difficult to get that first position, right? And I know I've spoken about this in the past, that it is not easy, right? Nothing comes easy to people. You, you have to work for what you want. Um, so when it came time for me to transition, right, it was a period in my life where it was 2008, 2009, you know, the economy had tanked right then and there. And so that's when I had decided, well, the humanities world is definitely no longer secure. Um, for me and what I want to do. So I had to really sit back and take time 
to analyze what my goals were. What did I want? Right. Um, so that's where I really said, well, you know what? I do have science in my blood somewhere in there. It's in my blood. Um, my father was a practicing physician here in the U.S. for just under 40 years. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. um, amazing internal med physician. Phenomenal. Right. And understands the person through and through their lifespan. Um, but I was never pushed into the world of sciences ever. And so, but I did really well in high school and AP bio. I did great. I loved it, but I was never encouraged. So anyway, I dug deep. I decided, you know what, there's something called medical coding. I think I'd be really good at it, but I had to really, I really wanted to take a long view approach. I know um, there are platforms that you can go ahead and train yourself really quickly in like six months. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is awesome if you come prepared with that science, you know, thick background. I didn't have that, right? So I really wanted to dedicate my education for a full year to a program. So I went under what was then known as Kaplan University. Mm. I believe they've rebranded themselves as something else. They still exist, but they have a different name. I don't recall off the top of my head what it is. But I went through Kaplan, which was a HEMA backed. So my training was completely AHIMA backed and I loved it. And right around 2008, 2009, when I was doing the training was when the whole CDI profession was growing. It was um, mm -hmm. starting, right? So I started to love that as well because I was right then and there at that time of its inception. So anyway, long story short, um, I applied to job after job after job didn't happen because my resume, and I know you talk about resumes on your platform, and it's great to hear Victoria and her guests talk about resumes and how important they are because I realized after my resume that read as a liberal arts art historian resume trying to apply to the world of sciences, it, it failed. But at the mm -hmm. time, even though I was a fully grown adult, I just didn't see the light, right? I just didn't recognize that it was that resume that was preventing me from getting in the door somewhere. So once I realized I had to tweak that to a more science formatted background, um, I eventually um, you know, needled my way into an amazing medical billing company that still exists today in Houston, Texas. Phenomenal this president of the company, she took a chance on me and she's still there today, still has her clients today. Incredible, incredible organization that took a chance. And I started in AR. That's where she put me. Um, I realized I was really good at that. I brought in a lot of money that was laying on the table for these doctors for a very long time. So that's where I honed my skills. I mastered my skills in multi-specialty doctors claims and appealing them um, to receive that much warranted reimbursement, which I could help fight for. Um, I wrote appeal letter after appeal letter successfully to the government payers as well as to commercial payers. So that's how I got my start to make a long story short, but it definitely took elbow grease to get my way in to the first position. Right. And then after that, I went into the hospital system just down the road at MD Anderson. So, you know, it's it's a matter of knowing what you want um, and working hard to get it. So even though you have a transition in a career, it can be done. Yeah. And I think it's good for people to hear more stories of how a lot of us did make those transitions into yeah. medical coding um, and how. Like I always share about how I started out in charge entry and I didn't become right. a medical coder until it was like my third role in healthcare, right. you know, and it's frustrating because so many people, they're like, oh, well, you went to school, you, that you're go going to school for medical coding and you think, well, I'm going to be a medical coder when I get out. And it's, it's shocking and it's frustrating to realize, oh, well, maybe I don't become a medical coder as soon as I get out. Maybe I have to go work in registration for a little while. Maybe I have to go work in accounts receivable, you know, and, and kind of weave my way through into, into the, the coding department. And yeah, I certainly 
uh, empathize with those people. And if I could snap my fingers and change it, I absolutely would. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's 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 just something that sometimes we have to be very tactful and have that strategy and have that plan and look at it from different ways and go, is it something like my resume that needs to be worked on? Is it something maybe my interview skills need to be worked on? Um, but yeah, I also, I think it's interesting too, that you were kind of coming in, in that era, right when we had uh, some downfalls, because that's, mm -hmm. I came yeah. in a shortly before that. And my experience was when I started into the industry, it was right when private practices were getting bought up from hospitals, mm -hmm. like nobody's business. So all of these sudden, these physicians who weren't on the radar before, because who's going to go over a physician, you know, attack a physician to, uh, practice that has, you know, two physicians in it, that's not a big target for, for Medicare. Mm -hmm. Um now, all of a sudden, here they are within this billing office and people are scrutinizing them a lot more. They're they're not getting away with documentation things that they used to in private practice. So I wound up working a lot more with, you know, honing in on how do we get these providers up to snuff with working in a larger organization right, capacity right, now. Right. And the things that used to fly in private practice now aren't going to fly when a lot more eyes are looking at things and, and we're more aware of the regulations and how we have to implement things into, into our practices. Um, now, you and I have both kind of transitioned from doing some more billing activities to into medical coding, now more into compliance, into audits. And I'm seeing as my viewership has kind of grown with me, some of the people that maybe passed their CPC a year or two ago are also looking into getting into more auditing, more compliance. But when you're first learning about some of these auditing activities, it's it's it is huge abbreviation overload. It's the OIG, it's the TPEs, the ZPICs, the RACs, the CERTs, uh, CBRs. So it's 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 a lot. It's a lot. So for these coders that are just starting to like dip their toes in, they're like, I just want to be a little bit more aware. I want to get more compliant in what I'm doing. What do you think is kind of the easiest point to start? start for them to just start learning a little bit more about how do I get more compliant and, and know about all this stuff going on? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, when you and I started out a long time ago, as we just shared, right, we weren't necessarily taught in the beginning about the importance of compliance, right? But now that we're fully into our careers and we've been around the block, so to speak, I'm all about helping people start their education process in medical coding with the foundation of compliance, right? I think it's important for coders, potential people who want to become coders, understand the importance of compliance, right? Um, coding compliance is critical. So I'm not just talking about the provider compliance, but coding compliance is also a must. And in terms of the complexity of those ridiculous acronyms that we're forced to know, right? Not only the acronyms from the provider documentation, all of those right. abbreviations, we're also forced to know all of the crazy abbreviations from CMS, like you said, the OIG, right? The Office of Inspector General. Great website to bookmark, to flag, to serve as your trusty tool because they do offer so many educational resources on that oig.gov website. Um, yeah. so many it's things, not a secret what the OIG is looking at. They, they lay it right out for you. This is what we're going to go look at. We're going to look at all of this. And so, right, we need to be mindful as coders that this is a free resource. It's open to the public. It's not a secret. Um, so I think it's a really good thing that you make it a part of your everyday, you know, work habit. Once a week, if you get on the list serve for the OIG, they'll populate your email inbox with what's going on for that week, right? Like the OIG work plan happens to be issued once a month. So get on that feed 
and take a look at what they're identifying. What's the hot ticket item, right, that they're working on, that they want to look at to see what can be improved. Um, there's also the CMS.gov website, right, which you should also bookmark. Um, make that as a trusty resource as well. Again, all of those acronyms are housed there for all of their multiple, you know, audits and investigations that they do from, you know, those search letters to the TPE, the Targeted Program Educate Program. There's all sorts of um, things that Medicare does to protect the Medicare Trust Fund, right? That's another thing that a certified coder should always keep in the back of their mind is that the rationale behind why CMS and the OIG are doing these things is to protect the monies, what little is left, right? right? To make sure that we're doing our very best to stay compliant, to do coding selections correctly. Because if, if we don't, that's what, you know, causes that trickle down effect of the overpayment demand letters that come about through these organizations like the, you know, CBR, the TPE, the certs, all of these people then um, may try and come back and look at your practice a little more closely, right? So I think um, more to answer your question, there's just many, many resources that I think a certified coding professional should be in the know about at the beginning of their career. I don't want you to wait. Victoria and I don't want you to wait so long like we did, like, you know, mid-career. You don't need to wait for your 10th yeah. anniversary to start, you know, bookmarking <laughs> these amazing resources, right? Start doing it now so you can be more savvy in your everyday work. I think that's a big thing. So from the government standpoint, those are great free resources. And then when your provider and your organization system also has commercial payers, they also provide free to the public um, policies and guidelines and manuals on the World Wide Web also. So those are also things that you can bookmark for yourself, like an anthem of California reimbursement plan that's active in 2023. Find it, bookmark it, use it, and share it with your provider. Um, and you can rinse and repeat that for all of your commercial payers as well. So just find those trusted resources from the payer as well as trusted resources like Victoria and myself that are happy to share You know where you can find more information to keep your providers a little bit more compliant and yourselves as well. Yeah. And that I think is such a benefit to this era, at least that now we have so many resources like your podcast. If someone's like, Hey, I want to know what's, what's happening right now in the, the regulatory industry. I'm going to go and check out. So now's podcast or even like Sean Weiss with the compliance guy, he's always talking about what's, what's coming up, what's current, what, what are we seeing out there? Uh, even as far as some of the legal cases that are that providers are getting hit with. So yeah, it's just so great to have the wealth of knowledge, uh, almost to the point that it's it might get a little bit overwhelming. But you know, to your point, so now being able to go back to those authoritative guidances of like, I know the OIG website, I know where CMS has their things. So even if, you know, I, those of us that work in the the higher levels of the industry, those of us that work as, you know, compliance officers or work in auditing or work as, um, you know, consultants, we're not always 100% correct either. We might misspeak something or say something that we think we are communicating a certain way, but it's getting perceived differently. So it's always that that responsibility of that coder, of that practice manager, of that physician to make sure that you are double checking that that regulation applies to you and your scenario in your area that, you know, it's not a different uh, Medicare contractor uh, differentiation there. So yeah, just and it. So it's important to equip yourself with knowing how to, to follow the breadcrumbs back to the original source. Exactly. That's a great point. That's totally spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
the AAPC recently released their salary survey. And in their salary survey, they do a lot of membership questions as well. And one of the things they said was about 55% of their AAPC population that they um, questioned says they're working from home. And there's a lot more that are working in hybrid. They're working maybe half from home, half in an office setting. And I just talked to uh, Kyle Johnston from Weller Healthcare IT, and he's like, a lot of the contracts that I'm doing, I would say like 95% of them are working from home. So how can coders create that culture of compliance within their workplace when so many of them are kind of isolated in their work from home roles? Another great question, right? So this pandemic, I think, has definitely brought about this swift change, right? So I know the coding profession is touted as, oh, it's so easy, you can work from home, it's super simple, right? Before the pandemic, we heard a lot of that messaging. But you and I know it's very difficult to, in the past, have just been working from home, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of important to go into the office so your employer can see your ethics and your integrity, right? That's very important to um, people now who are just unleashed and they can stay at home because of this pandemic situation, right? So I believe all of the people that do work from home do have to embrace that integrity and those ethics. And so they have to be able to meet their their production, meet their quotas, right? Whatever their employer sets out for them, those types of things have to be met, right? If they want a check-in point at some point in the day, if they want to circle back with you at the end of each week, whatever it is that your employer um, demands upon you as a work from home employee, you must embrace that, right? in terms of our security, that's also a big thing from our cybersecurity standpoint, right? I'm certain, I'm certain that 100% of your employers are shipping you laptops, right? You should not be working on your personal laptop on medical records and coding and Excel spreadsheets and all of that. You can save your personal laptop off to the side and do your personal stuff on it but your company shipped laptop or desktop, whatever, should only be used for your job because they've put those security features on it, right? To protect the organization at large. Um, So I think all of those things are critical in today's landscape of the, you know, quote unquote, remote slash hybrid employee, that security is huge because of data breaches, et cetera. Um, So it's important that you only work from home on that really, really secure laptop that your employer issued you and circle back to them, check points throughout the day, call in, zoom in, do whatever they suggest so you guys can follow up together on what you were doing for the day. Yeah, because I think I've heard now, even with the um, public health emergency ending, now we're starting to see some questioning about, okay, where we had previously maybe given some leniency because of this pandemic we were on, now HIPAA is going to be much more well enforced because of that that, uh, ending. Absolutely. No, that's a completely valid point. And I think as remote employees, we should always be protecting ourselves also, right? So your workspace should be secure, right? Like, so even though there might not be a policy, I don't know of too many organizations that don't have that policy, but you should be locking away any any patient information if you happen to have something tangible on, on paper, right? Those types of documents should be filed away. Um, you should be confident that there are not people in your home who are going to be poking around this type of work either. So it's always best practice to protect yourself as well, right? Even if there's not any written policy from your employer um, of what to do in those certain cases. 
Yeah, because we have to consider the patient as well. You know, how would we feel as patients if someone was sitting in their living room with a picture of our medical scans up and family members are walking by and able to see those? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, So bringing it back, though, to some of the coding, what are some of the common coding errors that coders should be aware of and how can they be prevented? Another great question. Common coding errors, huh? Okay. So let's go back to that OIG work plan, right? Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go back to how many years the modifier 25 has been on the OIG work plan. How many reports have been issued on the modifier 25 by the OIG? So and people still don't want to believe you. I still have physicians that will leave me nasty comments. No, I should be able to bill for both because there's a note and I did a procedure. I know. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard when we get that that pushback, right? But when it comes to our certified medical coders, right? Mm. That's still a common common mistake, hence the volume of the modifier 24, yeah. excuse me, of the modifier 25 still being on these hit lists, right? So, you know, we have to be able to show our providers when the modifier 25 is supported, right? For right. us to then be able to append it on that claim. Just because we feel the pressure from them saying, oh, but I did the, you know, no that's not correct coding, right? So you're not following correct coding compliance if you just are pushed and kind of bullied into applying that modifier, right? So we have to really be able to understand how to avoid those types of common mistakes. Um, Let's let's also perhaps address all the modifiers like 59, still an issue, Mm -hmm. still an issue, right? It's also been on the hit list for years, um, I have a crystal ball and I know we will see more mayhem with these new ENM guidelines, right? It won't be for a long time, thank goodness, because we're still in the madness of 95 and 97 guidelines, which are being audited today like crazy. So the crystal ball does show, yes, of course we will be audited on the new guidelines, but it'll happen later. So it's just a matter of always understanding our massive CPT manual, understanding how to read that new green text when it comes out every October, you know, make sure that you read it, understand it, um, you know, bookmark pages and things like that for yourself. But slow down is also my objective all the time right? Although I'm not the employer at the big systems where I know you have to push out the volume of the claims. But if you take the time to slow down just a little bit and understand the coding guidelines, you can do your job much, much better. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because when we look at, when we think about the CPT books and our ICD-10 manuals and stuff, they are books. And while it may seem funny to sit down and be like, yes, you should read them, like you kind of have to do, maybe not the way that you sit down all nice and comfy on your couch reading, you know, the latest Anne Rice novel or something, but but you do have to every now and then sit down and read through your manuals. Now, of course, you're not going to sit and and str- stress yourself on, you know, the definitions of every single code. You can breeze through kind of those sections. But going through those guidelines, notating, you know, where codes are, how they're organized, what's changed, uh, it it, it is very helpful to just kind of read your book. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. You have to be able to. Yeah. Have to understand it. Right. So one of the things I see you focus on a lot in your LinkedIn posts and your podcast is keeping physicians safe, right? We want to see them get... Um, you know, every penny they deserve, but not a penny more, right? And they complete, you know, this decade of schooling to become a physician. And it's a lot. It's it's overwhelming going through residency and the thought of going that going to waste because they don't understand a, a billing guideline, like that's kind of scary. Um, so how do you kind of balance that coder-physician relationship where you're like, 
you want them to do what's right, but you also don't want it to be like this scared straight program where you're going, you have to do this or you're going to go to jail. Yeah. Another great, great, insightful question. So that's something that you learn as you progress in your career, when you um, are graced with the opportunity to speak to physicians and other healthcare providers, you have to be able to understand the room, right? You have to be able to communicate with them softly yet firmly, right? It's a balance. You do not want to go in there like in America, we have that bad image in our mind. I think it will never go away of the auditor, right? The auditor is the big bad guy that comes in because they just see the bad, right? It's programmed in America to just think that the audit is going to be bad. They only see bad things, in my opinion, and why I do things um, as a physician champion is in the messaging. It's how you deliver your findings, right? Mm -hmm. I always stress it's so important to start a conversation with anyone with positivity, right? The doctor is a genius. Like you said, they went to medical school and residency for like 10 plus years, right? They know patient care. That's their specialty. That's their real house. So you know for a fact they did so much right in their documentation, so much great stuff, right? And so that's how I lead my education with them is bravo, you did these 15 things brilliantly when I audited, right? These, these seven additional things are where I see some deficiency, right? So nothing bad, nothing, no horrible language. It's a deficiency, which means it can be improved. Right. So it's all about how you communicate your message to your provider. And absolutely, it's about them getting what's due to them appropriately. Right. And then when it comes to appealing things, it's because you you have that eye on their documentation and you know that that service should be appealed because he or she did a brilliant job in their documentation let me help you appeal it and you can win those appropriate monies back. So it goes two ways. You have to be able to softly implore that these deficiencies have been found, but these are the ways that perhaps they can be fixed. You can help, yes. right? You have to provide them with the roadmap of how to fix it, not just say, boo-hoo, this is you know terrible and I have no advice to help you improve. That's right. not a good way to deliver information. Yeah. Yeah. So many times I've been in conversations with medical coders and they're like, well, I've been telling the doctors and I've been telling the doctors that they're not doing it right and they're not doing it right and they need to fix it. But you don't hear that flip side of it of, well, did you tell them or work with them on how they can fix it? Right. Is there a template that they just need to get hooked up with someone to fix the template? Like what, what, it, how do they fix it? Um, with the field of medical coding, we're, we're growing like crazy because healthcare is evolving a lot. There's just so much more detail. There's so much more volume. It's just, it's a lot. How do you see the field of medical coding evolving in the coming years? And what implications do you think that's going to have on compliance and accuracy? Yeah, I think... Another great question towards the future based on the landscape, right? Um, and I've been talking about this for years of how I, I've wanted to see us change. I've wanted to uh, all of us to actually elevate faster, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think in this new landscape of AI, they've always been around, right? Helping. But I do think that AI can take a lot of this kind of tedious, just data entry type of stuff, just typing the keys, right, and putting the code in. That can be done by these computer-aided systems, AI, things like that. Whereas the human mind, us, we're not going to be replaced by AI, right? We're needed to be elevated, right? I do believe we all need to be much more analytical 
right? All of those skills need to be trained on, worked on, so we can elevate ourselves um, to health practices in that fashion and to help healthcare in general in that fashion. That's how I think we're staying in our individual roles, but we're elevating them, you know, so much more people can be um, accessible to being an auditor, to being involved in compliance. Um, so the mere entry of the CPT, hick picks, modifiers, all of that stuff on a claim form can be done by the AI stuff. I do think that's where the landscape is going to change in our future. We're not going anywhere, but I think mm -hmm. we have to see and embrace that type of change um, and get ahead of it as well, right? So we're in better shape for ourselves and our careers in the future. Yeah, especially in some of these organizations and specialties where there is such high dollar amounts attached to these services. Yes. And I, I, I akin it to almost like my accounting services. I could install QuickBooks into my bank account and it could probably sort all the things and go, I think this goes here and I go think this goes here, but I don't want to take all of that and submit that to the IRS. I want my accounting professional to physically look at that, knowing all of those accounting regulations that I don't know mm -hmm. and help me sort through it and give me advice on, you know, what money needs to go where and how much mm -hmm. I owe out to the state and federal mm -hmm. programs and stuff. I, I, so while there is programming that could kind of do it for me, um, nothing's going to be able to replace a true mm -hmm. professional that mm -hmm. understands what's all the, all the nuances. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and I'm really excited about SP Collaborative, which is your business you. and you're going yes. to be doing a lot more things. Um, before I just even wrap up, can you tell me a little bit about SP Collaborative? Yes, it's brand new. Thank you for giving it a shout out. Yes. So mm -hmm. SP Collaborative is my own little venture that I just started up. So, you know, it's going to be a place where I provide um, quality assurance audits to our providers that need that extra set of eyes, right? Someone from the outside that can help look at what their coding is. Is it spot on? Is it compliant? Um, when it comes to presentations, content materials, um, checklists and things like that can be developed for your practice to help you again, do your job, right? So you're protected better against any potential future down the line, um, big overpayment requests and things like that. Um, yeah, so my gallery of services is being worked on. My website is not quite ready yet, um, but I'm excited for you know what the future is going to be like for SP Collaborative. It's going to be a lot of the same stuff that I've been doing um, for all of these years, but um, I wanted it to be mine, right? So something something different, and I've never built a website before, so I'm getting some help with that. But yeah, no, I'm just really excited. Um, for what it's my exciting. next chapter is going to show. Yeah. And I'm excited for you too. And it's so great to be able to have all of those options mm -hmm. to have to like, look at like, and go, well, there's, here's the bucket of all of these things I can do, but yeah. what are the things that I, I, I want to be able I to want focus to. on and the services right. that I want to be able to provide. That's right. That's exactly right. That's so well said. So, you know, my main thing, I have a lot of speaking engagements that are coming up through the summer. So super exciting, right? Like I haven't always been able to do things like that. Um, yeah. So all of that part of the arm of my company is going to grow as well. Um, and then, of course, all of my multiple clients that need their compliance plans developed. I'm big on that, too, right? Helping them mm -hmm. write one, craft one, right? Because as we know, hopefully your audience knows Providers are required to have a compliance plan and then a greater program, yes. right, in place. So a, a custom one, not just one we pull out of the box not and just, pull nope. the dust off and, and stick on the shelf. <laughs> right, exactly. No, it has to be individualized and unique yeah. to your service lines. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, this was a great discussion. And again, thank you so much. So just to wrap up, um, where can my listeners and my followers find out more information about you and your work? Wonderful. Okay. So I have a personal LinkedIn page that people can find me, follow me. And I also created a new company page on LinkedIn for SP Collaborative as well, where I share posts as well. So hopefully people can find me there. And then of course, on my weekly Wednesday, Paint the Medical Picture podcast, you can find me on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music. It's everywhere. Um, it's my second year of podcasting. So I love doing it. So hopefully I can get some more supporters going from this podcast as well with yeah. you. So yeah, I love it. So that's basically all my platforms. Oh, and my YouTube channel, which is not nearly as large as yours, but the podcast is featured there as well on my okay. YouTube channel. But yeah, I, I will put I will put the links to everything in the video description so that everyone can see it and follow you. Definitely uh, sign up for for uh, alerts with Sonal on her on her Spotify or Apple Podcasts or on her LinkedIn because she's always posting when their new episodes are up there. And again, thank you so much, Sonal, for being on the show. It was great to hear all of your insights. And uh, thank you for for being on the show. Thank you, Victoria. It was great to be here. <laughs>